Good morning, church family. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise today. Amen. Amen. How we doing? Amen. Hey, we are so glad that you're here. My name is Pastor John, and uh, one of the staff members here at New Anthem Church. So blessed that you're here and a part of our church family this morning. If you're a first-time guest, uh, maybe a returning guest in the last few weeks, we want to say a special welcome to you. We hope it feels like family and like home to you. And uh, like we say every week, we want to also welcome all those tuned in, watching by way of Facebook, YouTube, and our app. Let's welcome our online audience today as well. And uh, man, I am so excited to be bringing the word. We're jumping back into our series, Unveiled. Uh, what week are we on? Does anybody know? It's like, it's a week a lot. I think this is, is this our longest series that we've ever done? No? Oh. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, no, that Ephesians series killed me. Let, relax, okay? Uh, I think I've shared this before. I went to a church where we stayed in the book of Romans for two years. Talk about pain. Talk about suffering. It was really, really intense. No, it was good. Um, but listen, we, uh, we're so glad that you're here. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. We're going to be back in the book of Judges, chapter 7. We're going to be looking at the story of Gideon. Uh, but to begin, I, I wanted to actually start with more of, I guess what you could say, a declaration today. Um, and maybe if I could speak prophetically uh, this morning, it would be in this way, that the end game of your walk with Jesus is to be used by God. The end game of your walk with Jesus is to be used by God. Now, I, I don't know where you were at in your faith journey. For me, one of the revelations for me was that there was something more to my faith than just being used by God. I grew up with this mindset that the measure of a person, the measure of a man, the measure of a Christian was what they accomplished for God. So it was, it was all about what we could do and, and, and was I in church and was I reading the Bible enough? And, it, and I was taught a, a little, I, I would say too, late. It was actually probably not until high school that I realized one of the reasons we are placed here, one of the reasons I was born, one of my purposes here is to not just do for God, but to enjoy God. And God is to be enjoyed, and God gives us blessing, and God gives us uh, worship, and God gives us the church and community and family and this church culture to, so that we can enjoy him and experience him. And yet, even all of that, all the glory that's due his name, we've said this before, that you can wrap the, the uh, totality of the narrative of scripture into these three words, God with us, that God is first and foremost for himself, for God, and then he is for us, his creation, his imperfect, broken, and fallen creation. He is for us. He wants to encourage us and bless us and grow us into the likeness and the image of his son. So it's about enjoying God, but, but eventually we're going to live life long enough that it's not just for us about getting to become more like Jesus. There isn't a scenario where we'll go closer to Jesus, we'll remove sin from our life, allow Jesus to do that, allow Jesus to build our faith that hopefully won't result in God wanting to use us and use all of that fruit for his purposes. Maybe you've heard this phrase, that you are blessed to be a blessing. That you, God has brought you through what he's brought you through and brought you to this place, not just for you, but that you could testify to the world around you. This is why the word says to be ready to give an answer to be ready to testify of the hope that hopefully that we've received, that there is a scared, hurting, and broken world, and they're only going to know about Jesus, not through us, not through just inviting them to church, but through you, through 
you, through your testimony, through your relationships, that from what you would testify of the goodness of God. And I want to settle this in our hearts because this is why the third part of our vision is to empower the world. That it's not just about this experience. It's, we start there. Every, we, everything in Scripture has to start. Every revelation starts with an experience with Jesus. But we can't just stop there. Otherwise, we're just chasing experiences. We're chasing the Holy Spirit highs. We're, everything about our faith is about coming to this building, hearing a priestly pep talk, and hearing a fast song and a slow song and going home. But that's not the end game of our faith. That's why the second part of our vision is to equip people. That, that we should actually know about Jesus. We should actually get to know what is God like? What is his word like? How has he called us to live? And we don't do that perfectly, of course, because there are no perfect people, uh, skin and bone, in this church. But we rely on a perfect Savior to open up the word, word and do what we talked about last week, that interceding work. Where even where we miss, even where I miss in the proclamation of the word, that the Holy Spirit's going to fill in the gaps. And, and and we believe when those first two parts of our vision happen, we can empower the world around us, which is to say, be used by God to change a scared, hurting, and broken world that is in desperate need of Jesus. And that maybe now more than ever in my lifetime, amen? And so this is God's call for us. But I want us to get this down in our hearts that that's not the job of just pastors, right? Like, that, that's not the job of just pastors. Empowering the world isn't just inviting people to church. That's awesome, and that's a step. For some of you, that takes great boldness and faith, and that's beautiful, and that is awesome. But it's not just the job of pastors to preach and proclaim his mighty work, the, to, to preach and proclaim the work that God has done in you. Why? Because I don't know every single one of your stories, and yet every single thing that God has brought you through as a faithful follower of Jesus, he wants to use for his kingdom work which means there's a story you have to tell. You see, that's what I felt God calling my wife and I to when we were preparing to launch this church, that God had placed a story within me that he wanted me to tell. But this isn't just for leadership and people that are planting churches. It's for anyone that would call themselves a follower of Jesus and have their hearts open to the call on their life to be used, good, bad, ugly, the horrific things from our past, the broken, busted up mistakes that we made, our failures, and all of the good things and the good decisions and the times we were faithful. God wants to use the bad and the good, turn all of it around to be a testimony of his glory to reach the world. Are you with me, church? And so I, I want to clarify, and this is a bit of a disclaimer, I am not saying that your worth is based on what you do for God. I want you to hear both truths today. God wants to use you, but I'm not talking about your significance and your worth is based on what you can accomplish for God. That is a slippery slope. That's how I started my faith, and it didn't, it almost didn't last. It almost didn't stand the test of struggle and, and, and turmoil because if it's all about what I'm doing for God and, 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 and everything that I can check off the list and bring to God, and like, see what I did? See what I did? See what I preached? See who I saved? As if I had the power to save anybody? If, if that becomes our faith, this can be very, very dangerous, especially when we feel like life goes sideways or in some way God is, God is abandoned us or maybe we feel like God is doing things to us. This is a very slippery slope. Now, why are we starting from this premise? Because we're diving in, back into the story of Gideon, a man who was ultimately used by God. God, throughout all of the, much of the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, tends to use the people that it doesn't make any sense to use. This is Gideon. He was used by God, not because of his merit, not because of his courage. In fact, one of the only things we know about him from the chapter previous to the one we're reading today is that he was a coward. And this coward who was hiding out from an army that outnumbered the people of God in this specific region was called to something greater, was actually spoken over him, come out of hiding, mighty warrior. And so God wants to use a willing heart a willing heart. Let's, let's catch up with Gideon in our story. Um, God has called him out of the wine press, called him to a higher mission, and ultimately called him to take on the Midianite army, which numbered 135,000 military men. Now, this is not impossible for God. Nothing's impossible for God, although Gideon's army that he was called to lead was about 32,000 people. 
God does something interesting in the beginning of chapter 7. When he's talking about this battle that's about to take place, he looks at the men, he looks at the contrast, the 32,000 of uh, Gideon and his army and the 135,000 of the Midianite army, and he says, hey, you, uh, Gideon, your army is too large. We're going we're gonna to dwindle it a little bit, so, so go ahead and go to the men and just say, hey, anyone who's too scared because we're way outnumbered, you can just go home. And 10,000 men left that day. So Gideon goes back to God, and God's like, okay, okay, so we went down, uh, so we're at 22,000. Gideon, uh, your army's still too big. We're going to dwindle it down even more. And so we see this taking place until, as we're going to discover in the beginning of our text we're jumping into today, there's only 300 men left. God can do a lot with a little, Amen. We're going to discover that in our text today. I, I want to speak to something. There was something that, that really resonated in my heart as I was studying this text in the last couple of weeks. One of the things I believe that God is doing in this day with which we live is he's going to use the remnant to do incredible things. I was, uh, in the last couple days, I had met an individual to sell uh, some equipment on Facebook Marketplace, so it was just uh, a random guy in Facebook Marketplace. I was meeting up with him, and uh, as he was leaving, um, I, I said, hey, thanks for actually showing up, because I have so many no-shows. It's like mostly no-shows that people are like, hey, I'm on my way, see, the, see you in five, and then they just ghost me, they don't show up. It's so rude, like, why, what? Like, why would you do that? And so I'm like, hey, man, thank you so much for showing up. And this dude, it struck a chord. I think this dude was like big in Facebook, like marketplace, because he's like, tell me about it. And he just went on this whole rant. And he said, he said this, he's like, I don't know what it is with people, but it feels like the majority of people are just absolutely awful today. And I think there's actually some truth to that. Like, I know that's not popular to preach in church. Like, like, God's on the move. God's in control. God's moving in people's hearts. God's like, yes, and I believe all that's true. And I believe that revival is where we are absolutely headed. But what we notice about every single revival in human history, in American history that's taken place, it's been in the midst of everyone being really, really awful. And there is, a, I believe, a remnant that's going to take place. I believe the revival that we are at the beginning of, it's not going to come through these big uh, programmed events, these celebrity preachers. I am so grateful for the history and the legacy of people like Billy Graham. But I believe what is to come is going to be something unique where it's just God moving in the hearts of everyday people in a supernatural way. And I believe it's going to be through a remnant. It's not going to be through the 32,000. I believe it's going to be from the remnant 300. And my hope for this church is that we could be a part of that story. Amen? And here's why. Because God is not looking for flashy. He's looking for faithful. Amen? He's not looking for flashy. He's looking for faithful. Let's dive into our text, catch up with Gideon as God's about to dwindle the army down a little bit more before the battle. It says this, Judges chapter 7, verse 5. So Gideon took the men down to the water, and there the Lord told him, separate those who lap water with their tongues as dogs and lap, uh, 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 laps from those who kneel down to drink. And so 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs, and all the rest got down on their knees to drink. And the Lord said to Gideon, with 300 men that have lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands, and let all the others go home. And so Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept 300, who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up and go down to the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. If you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Purah and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. And so he and Purah, his servant, went down to the outpost of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the eastern peoples had settled in the valley thick as locusts. Their camels could not could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. May God bless the reading of his word today. Let's pray. God, thank you for...
today. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for your written word. God, it is our heartbeat that you would allow your word to speak directly to our hearts. And so God, would you allow us, for those of us that maybe came in the room resistant, maybe having a crisis of faith, maybe struggling, maybe having a rough week, life went sideways, there's financial pressure, relational pressure, marital pressure. God, could we just set that aside for a moment, not because they're unimportant, but because your word is gonna be the most helpful thing in all of those situations. So could we just, would you just cast out distractions right now and could we bow our hearts before you wide open so that we could receive whatever word, whatever message you would have us receive. We ask for more of your spirit, God. Would I decrease, would you increase in this place so that your word can go forth in power? We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. So God goes to dwindle this army um, down from now this uh, 22,000. And it's so interesting because um, he, he, he lays out this way that he's going to dwindle them down. He says, okay, um, those who are lapping like dogs. Here's what doesn't make sense to me. Like, I feel like a dog would just kind of be like face down um, in, in the water and, and lapping it out. But he said the, the ones he described were like dogs were the people that were, were lifting it, cupping it in their hands, and then lapping it out of their hands. And, and I, I dug so deep. I'm like, this is so weird. It has to mean something. And if for those of you that were thinking the same thing, I, it, it might not, but it might. One theologian points us to the reality that um, it was very common to have that posture of, of bowing face down to those that worshipped Baal. That, that's one theory. Another uh, theologian pointed out that it was the ones who, who cupped and would, had visibility and could see around them that those were the alert ones, more ready and prepared for battle, um, it's, it's most likely that God was just trying to thin the herd out, and he just found a creative way um, that didn't really make sense to anyone but him. And so we don't really know. Uh, there's a lot of debate. It, it's, it's a weird detail that's given. But all we know is at the end of all this, there are 300 men left to fight 135,000 Midianite military-trained men. This is an impossible battle. God has called Gideon right out of the gate, mighty warrior, to do the impossible. We see this incredible detail, and I'm going to camp here for a moment in verse 10, where God addresses Gideon this way. He, He tells them where to go. He says, go ahead and go down to the camp. But he says this such a powerful sentence and phrase in the beginning of verse 10. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant, Purah, and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you'll be encouraged to attack the camp. And so he and Purah, his servant, went down to the outpost of the camp. The Midianites and the Amalekites and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley thick as locusts. This is really incredible. So so he said, mighty warrior, I'm going to call you. You're going to lead my army and lead these people and see victory for my chosen people once again. But he says in verse 10, but if you are afraid, this is a powerful statement by the God of heaven. This necessitates this idea that although this had been spoken over Gideon, that he was a mighty warrior, that he wasn't quite there yet. That there was still a little bit of the hiding and the wine press in him that God is speaking to. But do you notice, God doesn't shame him in the midst. He says, hey, if you are afraid, because, you know, I knew, I know exactly who you were up until this exact moment, so if you are afraid, I'm going to give you an option of what you can do if you are afraid. This is so significant. Can I just say this? It is better to be a coward in your obedience than bold in your disobedience. It is better to be a coward in your obedience than bold in your disobedience. Friends, we aren't always going to have the luxury of feeling confident in what God is telling you to do, in where you feel like God is leading you. You might not even have a sense of peace. I know everyone likes to teach that and preach that and just, just wait till you feel this peace of God, but there might be t- God something God is telling you to do, something God is directing you to do that you feel nervous about, but you have confidence that I'm pretty sure God God is asking me to do this. We don't always get the luxury of feeling good about everything God's calling us to do. 
This isn't popular to preach in church. That's why it's not preached in church, but it is the truth. That's what we're seeing in this story. Friends, real courage isn't taking the leap, knowing God's hands are going to be there because you've taken a similar leap before and you knew his hands, his hands caught you once, they're going to absolutely catch you again. Real courage is taking the leap, being very nervous if God's hands are going to be there because you haven't actually seen God come through in that specific way. That's what real faith is. That's what real courage is. Boldness in disobedience and celebration of sin is plaguing our world. And so much of me just wants to camp there, but I can't because there's more to the story. But we live in a world right now, the tension we feel in, in the crazy town that is our world and is the nation we're living in now is that is a boldness in disobedience. Is, the, is not just sin, and I just kind of have this opinion of sin. No, it's the celebration of that which is most wrong and broken and toxic in our society. And I believe God is looking for people in the earth that would even in the areas that they're fearful and scared and nervous and apprehensive, stepping forward with the confidence that God has called them to something, that God has spoken to them, God has given them, or God has given us direction in scripture of how to live our lives. So regardless of what the rest of the world is doing, what the news is saying, regardless of what I see with my eyes, I'm going to trust the Lord for me in my house. I will serve the Lord. Friends, we need a we need a obedience mindset, even where we're scared. I began to think of even when I was getting ready to propose to my wife Cece back there. Like there was some, I had some confidence. Like I knew we loved each other. I knew she was super hot. You know, I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her, and I knew we loved doing ministry together. But like gun to my head, I didn't know. Like, I didn't know, no. In fact, I was really, really nervous because the only other relationship that I had been in had taught me that people's words aren't worth very much. And that was my only other experience. And so I was incredibly nervous. I was incredibly nervous, but I believed that God was doing something, that God didn't, God didn't bring us together for no reason. In fact, we prayed this prayer. For those of you that are single in this room, write this down. Take this note. We prayed every, I think we missed maybe one night, but we prayed 364 nights, 363 nights while we were dating. Here's how we would end every single prayer. You can ask Cece. We'd end every single prayer saying, God, if this is not you, if this is not your will, if this is not your direction, please break us up right now because we don't want to screw this up. We don't want to screw our lives up, right? We prayed that for 363, four days. And then God called us together to get married. And so I had faith, but I didn't have boldness. I I wasn't even certain of, of what I couldn't see. I just trusted and prayed that God is big enough to help me enough to not screw my life up too much by doing exactly what he's called me to do. So now let's go back to our story of Gideon. And let's not lose sight of the fact that God was so gracious that he provided room for Gideon to be afraid He provided a space for him. He's like, if you are afraid, he created a space for him to be himself. Well, watch this. While also providing a way to build boldness and confidence within him. By the way, this is a good general rule when stepping into the unknown. When stepping into places and spaces where we feel like like God is maybe leading us is all along the way we're looking for evidence of God. That it's not like, okay, it's an opportunity. They asked me to do it. I'm going to do it. No, as we start taking steps, we're looking for open doors. We're looking for God's favor. We're looking for closed doors. We're looking for resistance. And I'm not talking about just spiritual resistance because that can come from the enemy. And sometimes we call that a closed door and it's not a closed door. So that's not what I'm talking. I'm talking about like like things outside of our control where the the door slams shut. It's like, okay, clearly we're not supposed to be continuing to move forward. So God does this through a variety of different ways, through his favor, through signs, through through wonders, through open doors. In Gideon's case, through a conversation 
verse 11, it says this. It says, go down to the camp with your servant, Pura, and listen to what they are saying. So God, <laughs> this is, I just, I love this. God had this plan to increase Gideon's boldness, his confidence, his courage, through a conversation through the enemy. Like, this is hilarious to me. God is going to get his work done, friends, even through your enemies and through his. God is going to complete his work. And he's going to even let your enemies, your greatest enemies, do the heavy lifting. One of my favorite stories is when we were fundraising for the church, we had $23,000 left to raise. Some of you are like, was that your whole goal? No, we, it was like we raised a lot of it. It was like 300, over $300,000. We had our last $23,000 left to raise. We're like, okay, we don't know how we're going to raise this. It's like I had tapped every resource. I'm like, God, I'm just trying to be available. Like this has to become from supernatural means. And God used a non-practicing Catholic into his atheist friends to raise our last $23,000 in a single evening. There's like four fans of that story. That's, I think it's pretty miraculous. Like God's going to use the checks of atheists. They're going to pay the bills for God's work. Like that's how big God is. That blows my mind. This is what God does. And so verse 13, Gideon arrives. So he goes down into the camp. He arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. So, so he goes down to this Midianite camp, and he's overhearing these Midianites like, bro, I had this weird dream. And here's what he said. <laughs> I love this. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp, and it struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. What was it with dreams back then, right? <laughs> like, what was it with dreams and dream interpreters? Like, immediately, Gideon, all the people he was, they, they were, that were overhearing this, they were like, oh my gosh, that's so profound. This military guy is sharing this with no shame. Like, if Jed came to me and he's like, dude, I had this dream where this, like, loaf of bread, like, rolled into the church, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to be a dream interpreter. You need to stop doing drugs. Like, right? Like, that's what, that I've interpreted the dream. Like, I have this, a spiritual gift. You know what I mean? Like, that's, but, but there was something different with dreams back then. There was something different with dream interpretation back then. And there was something that moved in Gideon's heart in this exact moment. When we do a little digging, we discover that uh, this barley, and barley bread specifically, this was the food of peasants. This was the food of the poor, not just the poor, but this is also was food for dogs of the time. And so the symbolism that, that this, this uh, Midianite military person was having, this dream that God allowed him to have, is that the poorest the marginalized, the oppressed, the people they were oppressing were going to wipe out this army. Friends, God takes that which is perceived to be worthless and insignificant and uses it to do the impossible. Kind of like having a faith the size of a mustard seed. Kind of like falling a giant with nothing but a sling and a stone from a child kind of like the Son of Man providing a way for us to be forever connected to the God of heaven with a tree and three nails. God can do a lot with a little, amen? He can do a lot with a little. And the end game for Gideon wasn't boldness or faith or courage. It was obedience. It was obedience. This is what activated everything in his journey and in his life. Gideon's response to this prophetic dream. So he's, so he's overhearing this from the enemy. And his response to this dream should be ours whenever we're given reassurance or built confidence in our life. Let's read it together. It says this in verse 15. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. When he heard the dream... In its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. Friends, what is your response when God finally gives you the revelation you've been looking for? What is your response when he finally answers that prayer? 
Can I tell you, like one of my more recent convictions is God has just been revealing to me how ungrateful I am. Like, I'm the person that was like, like, I can't find a parking spot. I'm like, God, can you please help me find a park? Never mind, God, I found one. I'm that guy. Then like, oh, thanks. I didn't even have to finish my prayer. God has been showing me and revealing me in my heart, like, how little glory I actually give him for all of the ways that he answers and blesses and responds and encourages in times of need and pulls me out of dark pits and And God has been present. What is your response when God finally gives you the revelation that you've been looking for? We can take an example from Gideon. He bowed down in that moment and he worshiped. Verse 15 continues on. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out and he said, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Now we're seeing Gideon become not just Gideon, the coward in the wine press, but the mighty warrior. Now we're seeing the mighty warrior come out. One theologian points out it had to have given him some sort of confidence to overhear the enemy being fearful of his army and the army that Gideon was leading. Can I remind you that the devil, our enemy, who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, that he's afraid of the God that you serve. I can't necessarily say that he's scared of you, but he's terrified of the God that is in you and what that God can do through you. You should absolutely be afraid of this to the point, and I love this, that even when it came to Gideon's enemies, Gideon barely even had to fight the battle. We're going to look at how the story ends in a moment. But he didn't even have to fight the battle. He came with obedience. He came with willingness. And he stepped into exactly what God told him to do. Remember, moments before, maybe months before, hiding in a wine press. Now, stepping into God's providence like this. And look what God does. So the army of 300, they surround as best they can this army of 135,000. And then according to God's command, starts blowing trumpets and breaking jars, making all of this noise. And something interesting happens in verse 22. It says this, when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. Friends, I want to I wanna end with this this morning as we wrap things up. Obedience creates space for God to do the heavy lifting. Obedience creates space for God to do the heavy lifting. God could have won this battle and this victory a myriad of different ways. But this miracle was activated by the obedience of Gideon. This is what our obedience does. This is what our our faith does when we trust God even for what seems impossible. I would say especially for what seems completely impossible. That would be my question for you today. So what does your obedience look like? What does your obedience look like? This morning, I want to give you the opportunity to set you free from your greatest enemy. Oh, it's not a loved one. It's not your spouse. Please don't nudge them. This is not the time. It's not your wayward son or daughter. It's not that coworker. And it's not Satan. For the majority of us, our greatest enemy is ourselves. No one's harder on you than you are. No one's meaner to you. No one lacks as much grace than you do for yourself. No one lies to you more than you. Good and bad. And I believe this morning God wants to set you free from yourself in a way 
that will allow you to step into the obedience that will become the turning point in your faith journey. We bow our heads as we close this morning. This was the word of the Lord for us today. Obedience creates space for God to do the heavy lifting. And it is better to be nervous in your obedience, a coward in your obedience, than be bold in your disobedience. Friends, I want to remind you, God is looking for faithful, not flashy. God is looking for faithful, not flashy. And the work that God wants to do in this earth, that God wants to do through you, it's not going to be on the heels of you learning how to perform miracles. It's not going to come on the heels of you learning everything that the greatest theologian knows about the Bible, what if it's as simple as living a life of obedience? And what would that look like? Where we read the Bible and saw what God told us to do and how to live, and we just did that. Rather than saying, well, that's not culturally a thing. It's not culturally a thing. Culturally, it's totally fine for for two people that aren't married to live together and sleep together. and Culturally, it's, it's completely fine to fill in the blank. But what if for you, your obedience looked like, I'm going to discover what God's best life for me is. I'm going to see exactly what, what's required to do that, and then I'm going to the best of my ability to do that Thing. You might say this morning, Pastor John, we're not going to do it perfectly. Yeah, I'm an expert at not doing it perfectly. But that's why we have Jesus. That's why we celebrate the cross. I've, I've said this before, that if you've ever thought about the cross this way, that it's like this, it's this shimmering marquee sign reminding us that we're all screw-ups without Jesus that we're all broken and busted, even on our best day. If our best was good enough, God wouldn't have sent Jesus. And so it's not just about our white-knuckled effort to try to be as obedient as possible, to have the richest life possible. It's leaning in and surrendering to a Savior, God, who's going to do the heavy lifting for us. That when, like Gideon, we come with a willing heart, saying, God, do with this life, do with me, whatever you want to do. My heart's wide open, my soul's wide open. That gives Jesus space to respond, to fight our battles, even the greatest battles. That battle you're fighting, oh, you feel like it's impossible? Look at the battle that Gideon had to fight. You feel outnumbered? This is why we have the story of Gideon in Judges chapter 7. This is our consistent reminder that we serve a God. He's a military leader, but he's also a good, good father. He's a warrior, but he's also the great physician who can heal and restore and mend, but can also fight and vanquish even the darkest parts of who we are. But we have to say yes have to be willing. We have to surrender, and we have to be obedient. And so I'm going to ask we just bow our heads and close our eyes in this place. Um, I want to give you the opportunity to respond. For some of you, the, the largest part of today that moved you was the freedom in the reality that you can be fearful in your obedience, that it's okay to be apprehensive, that it's okay to be unsure. I know the world doesn't teach that. Our, our culture doesn't, doesn't preach that message, but that is the reality of the gospel. And God's gonna provide a way for you. Even the lack of faith you feel like you have, he's given you a measure of faith, which means whatever amount of faith, that's the faith that you can bring to the table and he can work with the rest. And when we do that and we start walking a life of obedience, that's where the confidence comes from. That's where he wants to restore everything that Satan's stolen from you with the confidence maybe that you once had in him. And so for you, if, you, if you've been, had an area of disobedience, if you've maybe even 
been bold in your disobedience and you're feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I just want to give you the opportunity to respond to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. So as we continue to bow our heads, close our eyes, if that's you, just anywhere in the room, just lift your hand in the air that would say, yes, Pastor John, that's me. I, I, I want to I be even fearful in my obedience rather than confident and bold in my disobedience. Yeah, God sees that. God sees it. It's all of us, right? All of us have some area of rebellion that we feel like God's looking the other way. He's not. And he's not not looking the other way to shame us, but to help us, to pull us out of the pit that we place ourselves in. So God sees those hands. God sees your response. And God is speaking to you today. And I believe that it's not words of shame because it's never words of shame, but it's words of life. So let me pray for you today. The altar is always open. Father God, in Jesus' name, we come before you. I thank you for every single hand that went up, for every single person that responded. It's responding to the truth of the gospel. It's not just about us. It's about you and what you want to do in us and through us. I thank you for every single person that recognized, no, I have some areas of disobedience that I need to make right. God, help me. Jesus, help me by the power of your spirit to walk a life of obedience. God, I thank you that you give us space to change our thinking and change our perspective. God, that we have freedom even in that. And so God, we thank you for meeting us here. We love you in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Come on, everybody said? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus praise this morning. Amen. Well, church family, we love you. We, we're so grateful that you're here. We'd love to connect you with you if you're new. Please fill out a connect card. Reach out to us. Connect with us in the lobby. We'd love to you to get to know our church a little bit more and, and show you how we can uh, you can get plugged in here. Uh, because contrary to popular belief, you were not created to do life alone. Amen? Amen. You were created for community. We want to help you on that journey to get to know Jesus. And our prayer for you every single week is the same. And it is this, that the Lord would bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, turn his countenance towards you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. Why? Because the best is yet to come. We'll see you next week.